All right, friends, welcome. This is a very special presentation we have. We've got our brother Todd Eaton uh, with us with a really, really important topic, and we're calling it Why Should the Exodus Matter to the Church Today? Obviously, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you're a Bible student, you know the Exodus is a huge uh, part of the scriptures, and it's not only in the uh, ancient past, but it's repeatedly referred to throughout the prophets and uh, even alluded to in the New Testament. So um, Todd is has graciously agreed to give us uh, a, a really in-depth uh, answer to the real important question is, why does it matter now? Okay, great, it happened. So what? So Todd, what, what would you say to someone who says, okay, this is great for history, uh, maybe archaeology, right? Uh, uh, foundation of our faith, etc. But why should it matter to me now? Uh, um, I'm often asked, where is even the proof that there is a God? This happens a lot, where, where it's like, what God? Which God? How do you know it's God? What is God? This question. And it's really amazing because it's just, it's just because we don't have words that are powerful like that. Like the ancient people had the ability to, to comprehend a, uh, a word differently than, so they could speak less words and have more meaning. And a single word had so much power. And we just don't have that anymore. So we use empty terms and they're so interchangeable like the modern treasury thesaurus, that we just we don't uh, we don't have that plugged in real value of words anymore. Um, but reality happens, and reality teaches us how to view the words. His word is truth, and so as truth reveals it, as it comes to pass, and we see that it is, it stands true. And then we go, oh, that's what it meant. But it isn't just that we have to wait for the Big Bang to suddenly come front, uh, confronted with God. And a lot of people that way, like, I'll deal with it then. I'll deal with it on Judgment Day. Or, you know, um, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, that's too late. You actually have uh, these things are given so that you would uh, you would be empowered in time to invest your heartbeats and breaths and steps and the means of your hands into the future and it wouldn't just just uh well you know i gathered for what and it all was vain um the answer that i give them as a proof of god is the one that i found in the petroglyphs that when when people were first referring to god there was this there was this icon for god it wasn't at i, did, I didn't know it as a word i knew it as a a depiction, a drawing. And this drawing in the stone usually seemed to refer to where water was. But it, it was always this idea of, of uh, I thought, um, that, you know, it's just this circle. It's this, it's this, uh, it's this circle with a, with a, what looks like a cane through it. It's a, it's a sphere actually on a tilted axis. Well, what is this? I just thought, well, the sphere on the tilted axis, it's, uh, it's trying to tell you to take a, take a tilt. And when, when you do, you find usually a water source is there or something. Okay, you know, something to give thanks to God for or whatever. But, but uh, as I came to realize what it, was, what it was trying to depict God as was the earth on a tilted axis. That, and that this is meant to be. It, it's what gave... It's what gives it's what gives man uh, the seasons. It's what gives the 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 weather. Uh, it is the rhythm of life uh, going around the going around the sun. But there's more to it than that, and it is the moon. And the moon is the is this this uh, maker of the rising and falling uh, of tides and the and the. Uh, the, the other rhythm of, of weather that is water generated and the wind and the water having this relationship that makes all God constantly in the scripture says that it is he who does this. He makes the cloud rise up and he pours the rain on the earth and and he replenishes the earth with the with the cleansing water and all this kind of thing. 
Um, but all this has, has it points at this amazing, you know, what God did when he made the earth and when he set the sun and the moon in the heavens. And we see at a total solar eclipse, this amazing phenomena that a man, a man standing on the surface of the earth sees the moon and the sun precisely the same size to the degree that you can actually see the surface of the sun called the corona uh, that shows where the solar the solar flares are and, and you can on see that, that i'm sorry to interrupt you real quick so we're going to get into your presentation and that's the first image that we've got uh is exactly what you're describing so uh, feel free to to stay on this and proceed through the uh, through the answers as they come. I just wanted to alert the folks. This is this is what we're looking at, and this is why. So as you're saying, you see the the corona, right? The the outside, uh, uh, the flares coming out from the sun, or as it's covered by the moon. Very fascinating. Yep. It's it's just phenomenal it, that that it gets uh, to the point where we actually like analyze it and say, oh wow, you know this phenomena that from the total solar eclipse. It, not not needing special filters to be able to look at the sun and you could never make out this detail we have uh, an opportunity and so people go way out of their way to make these total solar eclipses when they happen on the earth because scientifically you have a uh, an amazing chance at at uh understanding the health of the sun and uh and that that becomes really important with our technology because solar flares can disrupt our um magnetism and our and our uh, electric electric fields um, and satellite communication can be affected and all this kind of stuff but um, the phenomena of this that a man standing on the surface of the earth can see this perfect perfect overlay and it's uh, it's it's just it has to be just so you have to be in the totality you have to uh, you have to be uh, lined up at at the size of a human being to get that and so you see lots of pictures of the of a to of totality and rarely do you see it perfectly you know there's always some some bias because the overlay has to be just so but when you do it is really super good and and so this uh, this uh, this amazing phenomena that the the moon around the Earth sets up the sets up the sets up the uh, the rhythm of life and how and and that's all we see from the outside looking in. We see well, you know, the moon affects weather, the sun affects weather. This is set in the heavens and. And uh, that's all we think. It's from the, it's all from the outside in. The outside is affecting the inside is what we see. But how was the moon formed? This, this, the the moon. Uh, the same side of the moon faces the Earth as it rotates around the Earth, and and it it begs, how could that be? How could the the same side of the moon face the Earth? as it rotates around the earth the answer is it came from the earth and we know this because the rotation of the earth on its axis produces the same uh call it speed but we find out this how this works everything in science they would say there are no absolutes everything's variables but you you go far enough and you'll end up at these true points where everything confirms and you see whoa wow, there is order to the, all the chaos. It all does make perfect sense. And it all, all was meant to be. And this kind of thing, just realizing that, that like, like, the, like if, you, if you could lasso the, I think I get on with this kind of idea. Uh, well, no. Um, the, uh, the, the important thing is you realize that Earth has, uh, is, it wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't made like this. Is maybe the devil's big, big hang-up. The reason the devil fell, uh, accused God of making a mistake. But but the earth was collided with. Um, in the Bible, it's called laying the foundation. 
that he, that he, where were you when I laid the foundation? Um, this, and the angels sang together, you know, this, um, this amazing phenomena of the earth having an iron core and this movement within the earth of this met of this iron core is, uh, is a, uh, is a magnetic generator. It's a, it gives the magnetosphere to the earth that is the atmosphere. And this is what you read in Genesis is basically the atmosphere, uh, the importance of the atmosphere that, that water and, and, uh, and this, and all this heat and all this, all this mass makes an atmosphere happen. That is what we breathe. Um, this impact formed the moon. It was a trade-off. The iron core going into the earth splashed off the amount of what the moon is. But this had to be guided, and that is the phenomena of this otherwise cataclysmic event. The, the impact of a, what they call exoplanet and the earth. Uh, but otherwise, the earth would be still and perfectly, perfectly spherical. Uh, and there'd be no, there'd be no, um, no rhythm, no engine to the whole thing. It would, it would uh, not have all this stuff that makes the life that we've known. And it's a proof of God. This is like the first and foremost thing that, because of that, of that totality, showing that perf perfection of the placement of the moon against the sun. And the moon is just a quarter million miles away, and the and the sun is is 90, 90 some million miles away, whatever. Yet they overlay so perfectly, shows that it was from the surface of the earth. And then you get back to Genesis again, the spirit of God on the surface of the earth, on the face of the waters, uh, getting this depth reading that it is the deep and, and it is this relationship with it. And then it is this, it is, it is at this, uh, this Job's thing suddenly matters that, that, you know, this, uh, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth and, uh, the measures thereof and, and, uh, uh, laying the cornerstone thereof. And, and, um, this is just amazing stuff. If you could lasso the moon, you could bring it back in for landing on the earth. It's, it's, but as you do it, it would be like a ballerina when she spins that, that, it, that she would get faster and faster. And the, and the, the, the moon is like let out. Like if you can imagine spinning like that and putting your arms out, you slow down. And as you bring your arms in, you speed up. It's that, it's that cyclical, uh, rotational, amazing thing. But uh, this I find to be just the most fascinating thing. And I tell this to, to everyone that, you know, we, it took having, having uh, the, for, for the first, in the first sense, the size of a man down. Uh, which sets the population limits and, you know, how much time is available with the resources of the earth. Uh, but, uh, but more than just that, he had to have an eye. And so it is like he says in the Bible, he who formed the eye, does he not see? Or he who made the ear, does he not hear? And you see this in this, in this phenomena that, that from our point of view, there is microscopic and there is macroscopic and we are caught in this, in this perfect zone. It's like the, the Goldilocks zone of, of creation, uh, but in, a, in our own little microcosm that we're given vast ability to, to see, see the scales on both sides, you know, from, from great huge, we can make the Hubble, we can, we can launch it out, we can search the heavens at the same time, we can go deep into the sea, but not too deep. And uh, this kind of thing, and it sets the time constraint for knowledge that that man breaks through and gets as far as he does and has to invent the next step. But everything's like the revelation, a progressive revelation, and we are progressively discovering. Um, when when you when you decide you want to find out exactly where is this 
point where the where the moon and the earth come together if you did lasso it and you brought it together that point it's called the barycenter and the barycenter is a certain depth a certain depth from the surface of the earth and that depth is set it's it's made to counterbalance the or with the this is something that god had to have known and this is fantastic that that uh he, d he tells it in the Bible. He tells it in Job 38, and, and that's really the, the old, that's the oldest, like Job is the oldest book of the Bible. It existed in Moses' hands before he even put all the, the Toledot, the, the, uh, the records of, of generations and all the knowledge that he, got, that he knew from, from Egypt. And uh, before he consolidated it all into the Torah as we have it, Job was in his hands. And in Job chapter 38, you have a, a greater picture of the creation than Genesis 1 has. Genesis 1 is a blueprint. It's not the creation in seven, in seven days, six days and a seventh day. It is the plan. It's the before he boom bursts into anything. And that's chapter two, verse four. Should have been the beginning of chapter two. Actually has, this is the birth of the heavens and the earth in the day that the Lord God, and there's the first mention of the Lord, created the heavens and the earth. And so it's a, it's just a right, uh, you have to see the Bible right, you have to see reality right, and these check against each other to make sure that you're actually right. But this very center, is the point at which the volume of the moon counters with the volume of the mass that struck the, the that made the core that is in the earth and it is really what the whole shebang rotates upon is this very center it doesn't it's not against the surface of the earth and it's not against the center of the earth it's this point in between and uh the rotation is something like this like this is pulled together scrunched together because because the the moon is like a is is like a, a much bigger it's it's more like a third i guess of the size of the earth um and it's further away but amplify it and it's like this so as the earth is rotating on its axis this this force point is is on the side facing the moon and it's just the, you know, this is the tidal lock, they call it. it. It affects the tides, but it isn't outside in as they try and make it appear. Like the moon is is really going to, uh, uh, you know, um, the moon really affects the earth. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship, but it's just a phenomena to understand the, but it is this tilt. Now here I am at the earth with, on a tilted axis to, for the Earth to have this tilted rotational axis, that impact had to happen. The, the crash of this, of this exoplanet into the Earth, imparting an iron core to the Earth that it became its magnetism and is the motor behind the weather. And this, this uh, moon getting splashed off that, that re reflects the sun, gives us light at night, and, uh, and reminds us where the sun is, though we can't see it, and tells us the way you relate with the moon that you are standing on top of the earth. The whole earth is under your feet. And this, I think, is the great God revelation, is that everyone else is beside you. And the whole thing is, if you went straight up, you are on top of the earth. And everything else and everyone else is beside you and actually at your feet. And it's up to you to... Uh, to justify this with with your height and your stature, or whatever, and all the means you have, and uh, to lift up your the crown of your of your of your life, your, the knowledge, and to justify that with your words and your sayings, whatever. It's heavy duty stuff, but this ro this rotation on its axis is while we go around the around the the sun. The reason why the seasons actually change. Because otherwise, there would just be a hot spot down the middle, the hottest point, and there'd be two coldest points on the ends, and in between would be the only habitable zones, and we'd all be fighting for it. And uh, and in the end, moving from the north to the south, or the south to the north, but across this super hot spot. And this evens it out. So it keeps everything, there isn't a super hot band, a super hot spot, 
it all gets moved through. The winter happens everywhere. The the summer happens everywhere. The seasons change everywhere. And it's a beautiful, beautiful meant to be kind of thing. Um, so, you know, it's tilted for a reason. And uh, all this dynamic is, is in play. Um, then we've got this phenomenon that, wow, we think, you know, the earth always rotated at the same speed. Like I was talking about the ballerina thing. Well, if you, if you reeled in the moon, the, the whole thing would speed up. And uh, this is not fitting here well, and I'm really sorry about that, uh, because it gave a figure of when a day on Earth was five hours so many billion years ago uh, versus today. Let me see if the next one will show it. Well, this, it, this just shows that the moon is going away from the Earth at, at one and one half inches per, per year. So every year that compounds. When we measured it in 2015, it is uh, in the, the next year, 2016, it was, it was another inch and a half further. And in 2017, another inch and a half further. It's the moon is going away at an inch and a half per year. So the earth is actually slowing down and the time of the day is actually stretching out. And we know this by tech because, because technology has made watches so precise and we've gotten into going out to the universe and we see this, the phenomena of, of that the watch that was made before is slow by, by, that, by that much. Now uh, things have slowed down, whatever. Or the that it was it was slower. It is now demands you to be a little bit faster. Um, am I right about that? It's the other way around. Um, anyways, this this is phenomenal because you can actually pull it in to the point where when we were on the moon and we got the zircon crystals and we dated the moon and compared it to the zircon crystals on the Earth. That's an atomic clock, and we knew how old the Earth was and how old the moon was. We knew that, that uh, how much time had a, has, has elapsed between the moon being made. And so it's interesting to see this calculation that we can make out it's, it's that from the strike on the earth that made, that made the moon to its point where it is and it's continuing to go further. This, this is just phenomenal stuff. Well, then the question comes, where on earth did the moon come from? And the answer is the Pacific Basin. The Pacific, this is a bathymetric, which is really important. We're going we're gonna to get into ba uh, bathymetrics a lot in the Exodus because you need to know like where the crossing of the Red Sea was and, and why that's important. But for right now, uh, the, the first time that you're going to see that is in the creation drama. And that is that the moon was scooped out from the Pacific Basin. And this is, this is important. As you go, you not only have the, you not only have the, um, let's see if I can move my cursor in here. I can't. Um, I would show you off the tip of South America to the right, to the lower right, the line that it's a, it's a, it's not per, a perfect line. It is a curve, uh, but the curve that goes all the way out across to the left and that crack, that cracking where we're dealing with tectonic plates and fault lines that make the earthquakes and the volcanoes on the earth. Uh, but the, the important thing is that w this impact that, that caused the, the great subduction zone is all of these blue circles that are up between Alaska and Japan. You've got the subduction. Uh, there is, there is a, a renewing of the earth's surface by by a downturn that goes all the way to the core of the earth. This is where the core was, was, was introduced and, the, and the, the removal of material that was here became the moon. And this is now shrunk. There, there would have been a time when this would have been the volume of the earth that's missing that made the moon in size. And you see this as you look to the other side of the earth, and you see the Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean. And between North and South America and Europe and Africa, you can see that these were originally one. The coastlines would match up if you, if you just put them back together again 
you could heal what has been broken. But actually, this whole thing happened because the Earth had to heal from this collision. So oceans had to end up on opposite points of the Earth, and continents had to end up on opposite points of the Earth, and that's how this drama uh, occurred. But yeah, the arrows that you see pointed in the Pacific show the direction of that impact, because the plate is still the though it's though that is a that is constricting. The Pacific is shrinking, and the rest of the Earth is still expanding. In the middle mid Atlantic, you have this ridge that is an expansion, and it is the healing of the Earth is still happening, which is why uh, there still is earthquakes and. And the constriction of this Pacific, this Pacific, uh, this impact area is still happening, which is why we have volcanoes. And this, the bottom of the bottom of the ocean, actually shows the constriction. How this has continued to buckle and buckle and buckle, and it is under pressure, and it causes the ring of fire. All the volcanoes of the Earth that are around around this point. So you can see where the moon came from by the dynamic here that that the earth has been healing from this collision and the Pacific has been in construction under pressure and the other side of things has been the, and now here you got right down at the bottom it, it lines it out divergent plates are red and convergent plates are green. So you've got this constriction going on that is that is that is convergent, and you've got the expansion joint down in the uh, going between North and South America and Europe and Africa. You've got it, this red line that is a divergent. It's it's expanding, and this is important because the constriction, the compression and constriction isn't so isn't so critical. It causes the volcanoes, but that's mostly like the like the Bible says, uh, earthquakes in divers places. Now, when, way back I used to say, oh, that must be a typo. They meant diverse places. There's diverse earthquakes all over the earth. But actually, the word underneath there, the insight to the text is divers places, the deeps. So it's kind of important to understand these earthquakes in divers places has been has been constantly happening and is culminating. And the reason why is the Earth is actually cooling and shrinking at the same time that this healing is happening. And uh, all this scares the world. So they're like, oh, no, you know, the water, uh, this is going to cause the waters to rise. We're going to have flooding. Uh, so it is this in Luke where it says hearts, hearts failing for fear of things coming on Earth. Uh, the the sea and the waves roaring and I'm like well, why would man we be worried about the sea and the waves roaring you know but the powers of the heavens are 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 happening and this is the reason why this is really important stuff you find this this stuff in Job while while the while the Exodus hasn't even happened but it's in between Abraham uh, having been called by God to this certain point of the earth which is the next important thing. Why this point? Why did God choose this place uh, to, set, to call Abraham to? Like he invades Abraham's life saying, come out from your people to, uh, to see this place that I will show you. And it's so important that, you know, you go ahead and bring your family and bring your friends and, and whatever, you know, get, gather, gather together what you got and whatever, but, but come see this place. He's placing him for a very important reason, which uh, has to do with this divergent red plate here that goes around Africa. And it comes right through the Red Sea. The part that you see that breaks down, breaks off and goes down through Africa happens from this key point where the Arabian Peninsula and the African uh, and the African continent, these are separate plates, are under pressure. There is this like, there's this like a uh, hinge point there. And what's happening is the compression of what is the Mediterranean, and it won't exist in the future. And this is in prophecy too, that the sea won't exist. This is actually written in the in the Bible, that there that there was no sea, 
the sea was gone. Well, this is the one that he's talking about is the Mediterranean. In the, in the vast future, uh, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea will be, be turned into basically just a river. Uh, I just want to, sorry, Todd, if people don't know what we're talking about, that's the that's revelation. This is, I, there was no more sea, he says. And so oh. as in the Old Testament where it talks about the great sea, it's always referring to the Mediterranean, correct? Right. Yeah. Yes, beautiful. Um, thank you. Uh, this, this divergent plate that is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge goes around Africa, comes right through the Red Sea, and ends up at the, this connecting point with the land we're concerned with and the place where the crossing occurs and all this wonderful stuff. Um, this is just a, a good picture of how dramatic that is. That you, can, you can see the expansion joints, the, the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the other expansion on the other side compared to the constrictions, the sub subduction zones that are just black lines. And, uh, and it shows that how big the Pacific was where the moon was carved away and how that had to shrink down by expanding, by expansion of all this, all these other places, it's it's really neat to see that how it goes around Africa and comes right up, right up to that point at the entry to the Red Sea. And um, another picture of that from the other side. I think that's this is an important one if I were to get into on this, and I think it would be good to get into, but the flood. How the flood happened and where the flood happened and and how god made this take place that would be a, that if i were starting with noah uh, which might have made sense but uh because noah is kind of distant in this exodus i left him out of this but this isn't this would be an important map to bring back in for that and i should i shouldn't uh line it up better too but into the red sea at this point, there is everything, everything is continuing. Everything is a continuum that is connected, except these two at the Dead Sea. When you get to the arrow of the Dead Sea, this is all coming in the Red Sea, but the Red Sea terminates at the Dead Sea. And so does the other side. It comes in, it comes in from the north and it terminates also parallel to it. And they don't really know where the end of it is, but they figure the Dead Sea sits within the two of them, so they draw it this way. But in fact, in the Bible, we've got a better picture of it. And it is that when the Lord comes, he puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives and he, and he splits it. He causes a great earthquake to occur. And this is the one that, the one that, uh, that uh, John the Baptist was talking about, that, that the, that there will be this great earthquake that the that the tops of the mountains are going to are going to come come in and fill the valleys every valley will be filled and every high place made low and he's he's talking some serious stuff about the lord even though the lord is a man who is here being baptized by him he's talking about the greatness of this man's life that you know he's going to come in megatons of force and and he's going to cause this this to this connection to occur between these these fault lines, because uh, currently they are just sitting at what is kind of a linchpin. It's a, it's a locking point at Jerusalem. And why Jerusalem, and why this land? Uh, you see at this at this point that the whole globe, uh, the whole global network, whatever. And this is what he's actually talking about. That um, when, uh, but it's this isn't in Job. This is in the prophet Isaiah. Now Isaiah in chapter forty. He does, he does, uh, the, the Lord calls out man and says, and says, uh, and says, uh, like, um, like, haven't you heard from the, from the beginning, from the creation, haven't you known this one who, who tells the end from the beginning? And, uh, and he does a similar thing to Job, uh, to, to when the Lord appears to Job and says, and says, where were you kind of thing. Uh, he says the same kind of thing. And he says it like, who has measured the waters in his hand and meted out the heaven, the span. Now there it, there it becomes the span of the hand. And this, meeting out the heavens with a span. Then you understand how the, how the, how the calendar works between, if you extend your arm at arm's length, a span at arm's length 
is the distance that from the equinox to a solstice is a span of the hand. And that happens for both summer from equinox to summer solstice, as well as the opposite direction when the when the whole sun goes goes south for winter. Um, another span of the hand that it proceeds from the the fall equinox to the winter solstice, and it's a this is. The Lord standing on the earth with his arm extended, measuring with his span when he set the ro the rotation of the earth on its uh, on its axis with that same collision. It's just amazing stuff the Bible has. Each point made, but it comes down to this point right here where he puts his foot down and he connects them, and all this. All this stuff, the compression that made the Lebanon range of mountains and using the Arabian plate and, and this, this tran transit fault waits under compression for this event to occur. All, this, all, these, uh, all these fault lines are building up the pressure still for when it gets released. And when that releases, that transfer happens, it's a huge slip fault. Everything, uh, everything slides, moves in a huge way. This will be the great place to be <laughs> so, uh, if you're into surfing and and um, and skateboarding and or recklessness, whatever. It's going to be the time. Um, then this feeds into the Exodus story at this point, where it's like, well, um, how did the how did the waters get get parted? And for this. This, there is actually a whole site about this, the history of tsunamis in the Red Sea. And it focuses on this one rather than the other one because the other one shows a greater history. There has been much more. It's almost as if this side, the side that was crossed, was a virgin. Like, like, there, like it took an event to make the Red Sea open to the, or the Gulf of Aqaba or Gulf of Alat, whatever, to connect it to the greater Red Sea. Um, it, it's kind of a phenomenon. And it makes me wonder if maybe this was originally connected and it just, it's the reason why it was not even listed in the ancient maps is that it just wasn't even open. Um, the enterprise channel had to be, had to be carved into this bottom uh, the Straits of Tehran uh, to, to make it open for shipping to Latin Aqaba. Uh, and it was dredged for that. They actually made the cut the channel into it. But until then, there was, though you talk about a land bridge, it really truly is a land bridge. The depths here are so shallow that diving is just marvelous. You can, uh, you, you can, you can see all here at this point, even from space, you can make out this, uh, that the depth is, is so nil. The, it's not near like it is everywhere else. And I've drawn the fault line, the orange line, that, that will connect at that point. It just turns up to Jerusalem at that point. It just needs to be connected. And that's it. And when, when that happens, then the, from north of Jerusalem, and this whole southern thing connects together. And, you know, this is just amazing stuff. But I, you know, I bring the focus to this point because it seems, it seems to be, uh, because it, you got to kind of ask yourself when you're reading the Exodus, like, why would Moses turn south with the people uh, if he knew that it was terminal? Because that's exactly what the, Suf means Yom Suf is it's a terminal. It's a it's a it's a it's a way to a place. It's a way to a place that's a dead end. It ends, and so the, going the way of the the way of this, either either this is like Abraham who's willing to offer his son, knowing that uh, that this, I'm offering it to the God who can resurrect him. There is a resurrection. Uh, he can be put back together again, though I chop him into pieces. That kind of thing. Either it's that kind of thing, or and and Moses actually says, "I'm going to bring the people to a dead end, but God's going to do a, a 
amazing miracle here. It's either that, or Moses did, in fact, when he escaped from Pharaoh in the first place, go this way. And it's that so, kind of sorry, just to, to clarify, I think what you're saying. So if, if you see the words, the way of the Red Sea or the way of Yom Suf, it's basically saying the way of the end. Yeah, the way of, of the sea that terminates the, the, ter the terminal point of the sea. Got it. So, so here it is. You know, you, you're going to end up at this dead end. Um, if he had gone any other way, he they could have went around it. There, but once you go, you've gone through the uh, the Red Sea. The reason why I went through this last time, but it's because the the shallow where the where the where the Red Sea shallows are, the coral is close enough to the surface of the of the sea that it's oxygenated and it's red. Otherwise, it's just white, and the white coral is deeper. But this red coral that everybody loves, it's it it may even it may even have some some tie. Uh, there's a there's the highest mountain here in Jordan where I'm at is is uh, Umadami they call it. It is Mount Paran in the Bible, and when you go up there, it's like Mount Sinai, uh, but it's much more chaotic. The mountain is burnt on one surface. Just just like the just like the Mount Sinai is when you break the rock, the the burning is only so deep. Um, here it's like that same kind of thing, but it, the whole top of the mountain is jumbled, like it like the Lord lifted up and scrambled the mountain, like when he like he blew off of it or something. It's just amazing. The just mountain, to, uh, again, I'm sorry, Todd. Just to point out because I'm thinking randomly. You're saying the, the so the Red Sea is named for this red coral and it's oxygenated otherwise it wouldn't have the red color well that makes me think of our blood isn't that the same isn't that the uh, same yeah. way our oxygenated blood is why it's red and then it loses yes. that way. yeah Fascinating. right right ah amazing but umadami adami they say well dam it's blood uh and it has to do with the edomites the edomites named it umadami that is the it is the and there is red rock um so you know, red rock on the mountain of uh, Umadami, and the the they call this the Sea of Edom, and it being red with this coral, and and Edom being red. So Red Sea is really a good word for it, and they should should they should never try to apologize for Yam Suf, other than the Yam Suf does point at that this is terminal, this way that they're going is along the sea that terminates. Uh, so it, so it it almost you know it's like wow. Uh, there, there either is a belief in a, in a God of miracles, and um, and this is just something that we see in Bible that there's these wonders that occur, but otherwise he's taking them to a dead end, and he knows it. And um, these are the pearls. Uh, pearls of the Red Sea are are golden more than anything else, but they can be kind of orangey and even red, but. Uh, yeah, the pearls of the Bible would be this. It's not uh, um, other pearls from the rest of the world have come to tell us pearl white, but the pearls of the Bible are golden, just so you know. Um, this, pa this path across, the crossing, is an amazing thing. Uh, there are islands in between, so it, it, it didn't, you didn't necessarily have to, have to do this... Uh, like if you measure the whole red line, it's 18 miles. And 18 miles in, in 18 hours uh, at a mile a minute, uh, I mean a mile, at an, a mile per hour, to have 18 hours from, from 3, 3 p.m. in the, when, when, when it says the, that um, Pharaoh showed up with his army, from the time that they end, they they go running off into this at 3 p.m. to the nine o'clock in the morning, they're at the other side, uh, the rising the the rising of the sun above the mountains, uh, hitting this desert. This at that point they are across. So if, within that 18 hours, they had to go 18 miles. That's the that's kind of the phenomenon here. If you did the whole red line, but it's kind of interesting that uh, there's this. Um, there's this chance that they were already kind of across at a much shorter point and just followed the whole island uh, 
chain going across. But uh, all this I leave to speculation, but it, it's still just amazing. Um, getting across to the mountain. That's this mountain. Then you gotta say, why this mountain? Why did God choose this mountain? Um, I say it is because it exists in a series of mountains that are all blackened tops. The blackened tops are all a chain of these mountains. Um, and they say Jalal Loz, but Aloz is the highest mountain and it is, it is not it. It's not, you know, there's, a, there's a radar base there. there. It's not a blackened mountain. But within the Aloz mountains is this, is this Makla set of mountains, Makla 1 and 2. And it is the mountain as we know it. But it exists within a whole series of blackened peaks. And, um, and I say that it is because he is the God who hides. He always wants, on the one hand, he's going to give you ample proof. He's going to give you the, the story and all the narration, and you can follow it. And you can see this is evidently true because of the things that he said and the things that we see uh, versus if you won't read the narration and you're just plain taking somebody's word for it. And along those lines, I have to say, well, why didn't they ever say about about Catherine, um, about uh, Jebel Katrina or whatever, the, uh, the, the mountain in Sinai, because there is no brook that descends out of the top of it. And it says that he brought the people to stand, all the people, this is like a million people, to stand at the base of the mountain. They came before the mountain and he, and it, it, Moses introduced them to God. And that's a phenomenal thing. But there is no, no such a plane before that. They, you have to sit there at Devil Between and say, where were the people? Where could the people have approached the mountain? They must have been way out there. You know, it's this thing. Um, it's this phenomenon that you have. It's like, well, the mountain didn't burn. There isn't a brook. There is no altar. There is no pillars. There is no, all these things. Well, this is what occurs here at this mountain. And for that reason, it's, uh, it's, it's the plausible deniability. They could say, oh, well, these are blackened mountains anyways. You know, it's, uh, it's volcanic in nature. These, this is, this is, uh, um, Oh, what is the basalt stone? It's the it's basalt stone. So it's so you know it's volcanic, and um, and this is the chosen material for writing covenants in ancient time. Anyways, that the ancients used. They preferred the, the basalt for for inscriptions over anything else. Marble is the second choice, but marble is not so so tough as as the volcanic stone. The volcanic it can it can it can take a, a lot more abuse and not so readily scra scratch and everything else. So, so then he ends up putting it in an ark. Uh, when, when he takes those black stones down and he, and he sees the golden calf and he shatters them, um, then he's commanded by God, well, you go, you go make two, two tablets now, just like the first ones, you know, and he would have known the thickness and the, the length and the width because he handled them. So he's got to now make them again from this quarry. Now here's the marvel of the story. This mountain and only this mountain, only Makla, of all the mountains anywhere has marble. And it is pure white. It is the most beautiful marble I've ever seen. And uh, it's gleaming, glitterous, uh, shiny. Uh, it's just awesome, pure white. Now so I've got some pieces of that. It's the, mar the marble is the marvel. It's the marvel, yes. Right, he, okay. <laughs> he got that marble and hewed it, and we find that quarry. And and that's what those pillars are made of, and everything else, that white marble becomes everything. So the stones that are in the ark, if and when we ever find it or whatever, if it's ever seen, would be pure white marble stones. And the ones that we the pieces that we find at the base of where the where the golden calf was was beaten and ground down he did it with the stones he actually dashed the stones and then used the stones to to break down this uh it's like well fine you know the covenant this covenant from the real god is going to destroy your false god basically but we find all those pieces at the at the base of that of that calf altar pieces of that black rock and um i've only i only found one corner 
one corner that showed all the, that was enough to show the thickness. It was my concern. It was like, there's lots of pieces with straight edges, but I found only one corner to be able to know the thickness of the tablet. And I really wanted to know that, how thick were the tablets? Um, because in recreating it, uh, that's the important dimension. It tells you how big the script was. Um, now, from this point, I've got to actually like do this um, exit here. I don't even know how to do it. Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and do this. I have to go all the way back to the very beginning. To the beginning. When, when God chooses Abraham, he chooses Abraham from this, the beginning of kingdoms. The beginning of kingdoms, the first one is the Hurrians. And the Hurrians are the are what will be what will be like the it is the Hittite, the clash with the Hittites, it is the it is the it is what causes the the Babylon to become empirical. Uh, it is it is what starts with the Assyriology, the roaring of of other than this, it's Egypt. Egypt though is not really empirical it is it is an empire it is an empire but it's not empirical egypt is not at the time of abraham invasive it's always been happy to stay in egypt and abraham is called out of what will be the beginnings of empire with the assyrians and ba babylonians and and persia and greece and everything else all this roaring of empires He's called out of it to make the terms of peace. This is an amazing thing. He's, he's called out of, out of Haran, which is right kind of smack in the middle of, the, of this. There's a central red point. That Haran is where he's called from, and it's just to the south of Urfa. And Urfa is where the, is where the traditional birthplace, according to all the all the people who actually live here, uh, despite the West saying it was Ur in, in Sumer and going on that as much as they possibly can, that he went a long ways from way down in Ur in Sumer up to Haran, uh, according to actually the whole, the, whole, the whole thing here, and according to the later on in the Bible, it's going to confirm it, he came from this Urfa, just from Ur to Haran. It's it, a really short little distance, and yet it was enough to lose the the uh, the one who died in the one who died in Haran, and and he's called from there to to enter into the land. Um, here it's called Sanli Urfa. The Urfa or Sanli Urfa is where he came from, and just goes out into the middle of this. This plain is nice. He could have stayed here. It's a nice place to be. It's lush compared to the mountains around. He could have stayed there and just been agricultural, but he's called out of this, which, which uh, unbeknownst to him, is smack in the middle of these empires. And these empires, the beginnings of them go way, 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 way back. In this picture, you have Haran at the top uh, and Urkish, which is associated with Ur, Ur, Ur at, Ararat, Ararat. There's all these Urs. Ararat is actually Ararat. Urkish is the is the empire that is at the base of Mount Ararat, and Haran, who is in the in the descendants from Ararat after the flood, you've you've got this whole thing that occurs. Um, but in in the periphery of this, you've got tablet makers, and they are like Ebla, off to the left, Mari off to the right, and um, Urkesh, had he, had he just stayed in this Urkesh area, had he just stayed in Urkesh, is, expanded into Haran, he, if he would have just stayed there, he would have been in the capital of the Hurrians. And it would have been a great place to be. So he's kind of saved already from the expansion of urban, the urban expansion. But in the process, it, it, at the same time that Abraham is being called out, uh, all these people are tablet makers. Ebla has a huge library of uh, 15,000 is the count here, tablets that have been found in Ebla. 
And the same kind of thing happens in Newsy and, and uh, I think it's something, something more like uh, 15,000, 14,000, but it's still a huge library of tablets. So these people are writing and writing is going to inherit the future. And these people are warring over who's, who's, uh, um, whose history is going to make, is going to inherit the future. It's just like it always is. Whose history is going to is going to rule the world, and and none of them do. And that's what God says, basically. They're all going to come to nothing. But yeah, it, in t until that point, um, I, he just starts with this small one man, Abraham. These tablets they have the same kind of format as the Decalogue. We find out later the writing size is determined by the thickness of the tablet. And, and uh, they write on all sides. All the tablets that we find are not just written on one side and the other. They're written all the way around. They, use, they write like crazy, writing around the edges too. Um, the interesting thing here is when you go the way of Sumer, had, had Abraham actually come from Sumer, there's an interesting thing there, and that is that God to them is this I've got it. I've got it in the block. Good. We get our word God from this very word becoming the the Indo-European origin of the German word that is good and that is God to us. So the very first text that has God, G-O-D, in it is this German text, and uh, it goes all the way back to good. That is this ox, bull, meaning strength or might figure. And still to this day, they are all about making it about the might of God, mighty God, strong God. Uh, but God is also the word good. So what is good? Strength. What is good? What can haul the load? You know, whatever. Um, Abraham is called out of Haran, and he's called all the way through the land. Uh, he, he, goes this, he goes into the land, but he goes all the way through, ultimately, into Egypt. And Egypt at the time is, is going to be confronted with these other empires. They're going to come down after Abraham. He's just simply going ahead of, of the inevitable. And this is just what God does, you know, sends him the way that it, the concourse is going to go and into Egypt. And it is in Egypt where his continually, he, he, he goes to Egypt and uh, his son is told not to go to Egypt. His, his son is kept out of Egypt, but he just stays right on the border. But his grandchildren, come Jacob having actually great-grandchildren, but his grandson, Jacob, would have 12 sons, and, and one of them would be betrayed as a child into Egypt. And because of this, all, all of them end up coming into Egypt, and uh, it, all, it all matters. But first... Abraham. Abraham is coming through this land, and it is the promised land. Um, the promise being that wherever you go, wherever you go in your life, you're inheriting it. Wherever your foot travels, you own it. Remember, you stand on top of the earth, and it's all under your feet. And whatever you see, and he says this to Abraham, lift up your eyes and look and see from where you stand to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, all this land I give you. So it is where you're going that, and where, what you're experiencing is your heaven. You got to kind of understand that, that, you know, this, you're going to, you're going to be sharing your, your inherit, your, your heritage is this. He's giving you all that, all that, all everywhere you go and all that uh, passes through your hands is your experience and you're passing it on. And this is what Abraham does. He does an amazing job. He's challenged to count the stars. When he counts the stars, he makes shapes. And the shapes of these, when he connects them all together and says, I counted these stars, I counted these stars, as they go, all these shapes become the alphabet. Abraham is the inventor of the alphabet. And because of this, he is the inheritor of all nations. All, he is the father, the source. The uh, the uh, he is the resource, if you will, 
of all nations. We all have the alphabet that we put our fingers to on the keypad that gives us to communicate between multiple languages. Now, now every language has come to the alphabet and is using it uh, globally. It's the big deal. And it proves to be the big deal from the time of Abraham. Abraham goes into Egypt, leaves the first witnesses of this alphabet and preserves it in his progeny. And, and both sons that go both directions have the same proto alphabet. And it's petroglyphed in the rocks and it's by that 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 we can uh, we can mediate the languages that are most crucial. When it comes right down to it, is Hebrew that has perfect definition preserved in all this literature, and Arabic that is preserved in the application. It it understands the like Greek the dynamic of application. the the word the the word that you've defined finds application in these things. So. Where, where, where Arabic didn't understand the origins and, and the uh, weight of the etymon and the, the value of taking a meaning of one letter and the meaning of another letter, putting it together into an etymon and working out uh, the meaning of letters and infixes, prefixes, suffixes, like the, the meaning of a letter is in or for or to or as or whatever. A whole word is in that letter. And so that letter, when it prefixes another set of letters, becomes in beginning or or to such and such uh, or for such and such or as such and such. This happens amazingly with Hebrew. But Arabic has simply understood pronunciation. You pronounce a thing. And so it's like multiplied. So to keep Arabic in check, you've got Hebrew. And yet to activate Hebrew, you've got Arabic. And here we are like right on this border and it's the re it's the line that we saw before that goes between us. And it is a great chasm to come uh, also. Uh, and yet there is a passage in between that he makes. And it's a it's a marvel that he makes a highway and he makes a he makes a smooth way, a way that you didn't know to go before. So that the what what is the Exodus route? is actually going to bring you to the point where you need to be. And it's amazing because Abraham, uh, the, the children of Abraham, the tomb of the patriarchs and Shechem, where Joseph was interred, lines up at that point. And when they crossed into the land across, across the river, it was a landslide at that point that blocked the river, dried up the river so that they could walk across. And that's kind of a phenomenon, how they went across on dry land into the Exodus and then went across on rocks they had to place, but but uh, the river had been had been circumvented upstream to allow them to cross across the Jordan. Uh, it's a phenomena. Bible keeps on repeating itself. Everything that was is a microcosm for what will be, and it just keeps on growing. Uh, but it, just like the meaning back then, launched out over a global thing and it is global in its in its meaning now it will also converge again to the land it comes like, oblong like a football it tapers back to the point again this is actually how the anointing is squeezed out if you look in the uh in the uh, in the egyptian the, when they when they are making anointing they put it in these these big squeeze things that that turn sticks and and they rotate around the, the mouth of the jar that the, the anointing is going into and this all this uh has meaning to us who know that that christ is anointing and it is to rub with it is to interact all this is in a great big interactive thing and you really got to come here and see the the culture um to understand these things um allah and l and El, uh, Elaim, if you if you put it in this, they call it plural of majesty, but it's actually the many fields. El, if it were a singular thing like it was in the Canaanite times, would just be simply to, toward. And it is in the Bible everywhere that way. It's like, uh, this is what you're toward. Or you're to, it probably, this rock just simply meant, here's where you put the ore, put to this point. You know, this is the drop point for the ore that you have mined because it was found at the mine. So this L, God, is literally simply the, the Canaanite idea of what God is, the goal, the objective. 
This is where you place it. And it has that meaning in the Bible too. It is the objective, but it is Elaim because it is the objective of all things. Every field, every, every we would say science, but it's to it's like the idea we say of gods, the fire god, the water god, the weather god, the the mountain god, the storm god, whatever. Well, all these things, all these things are toward one ultimatum. It is all directed uh, of by and for to the this this unity. It is uh, uh, it is uh, it is one God, and yet there is no way. So, like in Bible, you never see God singular. It is your own God. Well, that's the only time that you have the single form is when it it's, it has your suffix, my God, or your God. Uh, then it doesn't have the plural ending because my God is singular and your God is singular. Uh, it's according to your goal, your objective, what you're after. But the biblical word Elaim is always the multiplicity. It involves everything. Every single thing uh, of all that is, is by God and for God. And this is important to realize that the only way we can relate with God singularly is the Lord. And the Lord is is the one only only he is the the lord is one he he only has this he uh, uh, wherever the he is for god it is him wherever uh, you know it is it is this amazing thing where with him it all is unified it comes down to he has a face he has a he he has a body he has hands that we can hold we can hug him we can we can relate with him see his expression uh, it's a very, it's a very, uh, uh, it's like uh, you're not just looking at space then as the unapproachable. You're seeing the, the space suit. You know, we are, with him, we have a suit that fits, that we can relate with God because we have a human shape. Uh, and we have this, this, um, this sphere that relate, that can relate with us, with cold or hot or thirsty or hungry or whatever. Oh, thank you. Um, when when Moses came, or what, not Moses, when Abraham came, he came from a place where these exist, rams. And rams are all over. The, they are the glyphs in the mountains where Abraham came from. He was very aware of this ram. This ram, uh, it's important that you know what a ram is. It becomes it becomes becomes most important in the Exodus route uh, and in the revelation at Sinai. But uh, knowing a ram, uh, it, 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 it clears up so much. Um, I think I'm just gonna move on just so you see that this is, an, this is the type of ram that Abraham knew in his home up north uh, and is glyphed there. They always have that kind of, the reason why is the first letter the first letter, uh, it became the Canaanite ox. Uh, the, the, the Canaanite preserves when, when, when the sons of Israel went into captivity in Egypt, uh, they were with Canaanites. Abraham was living with Canaanites. And when, when the famine happened and they were going into, it was the Canaanites who were already the servants. Um, Hebrews were freelancers. They, did, they, didn't, they, they weren't the slave base kind of thing that Canaanites were used to being. So so Canaanites were already there, but Canaanites had the alphabet from Abraham in their own way. So five of the Canaanite, the proto-Canaanite letters are bent toward the Canaanite idea. This doesn't exist in the proto-Arabic. The sun, the sun Ishmael that went the other way took the it took a different view uh, it isn't the upward view of the stars. He doesn't see the letters in the stars. He sees the 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 what Abraham was doing for for Ishmael was writing with his finger in the sand. So the from the the same way that he's like uh, he's like he's like your 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 uh, your people shall be as numerous as the stars of the heaven. He's he says the same kind of thing earlier, concerned with with uh, with uh, Ishmael, who's going to come first, the, that they will count as the sands of the sea. 
because the sand, the sand of the sea is level. It is the the water the water comes in and levels the sand. And when you write with your finger, you break that surface. And easier than pecking and scratching lines in hard rock, you can design the alphabet easier with your finger in the sand. And it's kind of interesting that when when the the woman is brought is brought to be stoned to the Lord, that he bends down and writes with his finger. Uh, it's it's like getting back to this beginning of what the word means. If if you if you only knew the meaning of the word, you know. And it it comes down to this that the the Canaanites understood the object in the heavens. The Canaanites understood the that he was counting the stars and he was finding these shapes. That's how he taught the Canaanites. But the Canaanites saw up there the ox, and this is really amazing that what was certainly a ram to Abraham was interpreted as an ox. I guess a ram being a, a lead position or being a free entity wasn't good enough for the Canaanites. They needed a strong thing, or it could go all the way back to the good thing that we saw in, in the Sumer. But anyways, this phenomena of the difference between Hebrew and Canaanite, this distinction happens because of that ram. And it is a ram that is caught by, caught in a thicket by its horn. And it is a ram's horn that becomes the shofar. It's all very important that you understand the ram and why it is a ram. The, uh, the first letter called Aleph today, which is actually thousand, not ox, but it is the idea of great, a great number. Um, the pronunciation of it is, has been something that baffles everybody. What is the default pronunciation of the Aleph? Because, because that will become the sound that you make. And I say, ah, like, like alpha, like alpha and omega, like apple. Just go ahead and say ah. You know what is ah, but don't ever say ah because that's another letter. Um, it's the omicron or the ion is the ah. Uh, so this isn't an ayil, it's an ayil. And an ayil is an important thing that you that you know it is this. It is this, it is the glottal stop. It's when you get bumped. It is it is in Arabic, i, e, a, or a, uh, and it can be any of those. It, it, and so you'll you'll hear the those words like in the call to prayer or in the prayer that have all those sounds for the for this one letter. Uh, and yet there is this problem that they also bleed it with the a, uh, just like modern Hebrew does. So they will uh, Jew will say Aleph, and they they will say Allah. Even though it, it should be technically i, a, a, or a, uh, and never a. Uh. But anyways, these, this kind of stuff is what you is what you learn as you get into this. Um, the more and more you know, um, the alphabet, as we would say, was invented in Egypt. We find the earliest writing there, and and we stem it, we connect it with Egyptian, but it isn't. Actually, the the word for the character in, e in Egyptian is not the same letter or sound as the, as the letter that we associate with it. So it really is not true. It is Abraham counting the stars who went to Abraham or, or, or went to Egypt and his progeny went to Egypt that causes these glyphs to be found there. And it's part of the testimony to the time that, that was served in Egypt until the Exodus. Um, the letters were preserved, those letters, those proto-letters were preserved only in the breast, breastplate of the high priest. And this is a calendar. It's a, it is the stars of the heavens as they, as they go through the course of the year is the alphabetical order. So uh, as, the earth, as the earth goes around the sun, it's not perfectly circular, whatever. So it accelerates and goes through, even though these letters are the same size in the heavens, the, the month that you see the letter in the heavens as, the, as yeah, at nighttime, the, the night sky is pointing out to that part of the rotation around the sun, you see that letter. Um, it becomes more 
condensed towards the end. Um, the, um, the initial ones are slow. So you have one letter per, per spring month. And it starts with the spring equinox, late March. So I would say April, May, June is spring. The primary is at the top. And then um, April, May, June, July, August, September. Uh, it is interesting at this point, though, that you see that it happens in March, and it was just a long time before the Romans got around to realizing how to how to uh, how to um, how to uh, coordinate the year to you know, and they end up with the equinox at the 21st of March when it was originally the beginning of spring. Should have been March is the is the month. So if you went from March, April, May, June, July, August, sept, seven occurs at the seventh. Oct, like octaves, occurs at eight. Novum, like nine, uh, occurs at, at the ninth. Uh, de deca, December, is like like the, dec the decimal system, 10. Ianu, 11, uh, January, uh, all of these, the months, September, October, November, December, follows the Hoshin. Exactly. And it's it's kind of interesting to see that. But because of that equinox coming late in March, we end up with the, we're, we're, uh, we're not in tune with the, with the Hoshin anymore. But these 12 stones preserve the alphabet that Abraham counted all the way through, and it becomes the oracle that God communicates in uh, in Moses's tabernacle and the uh, or the the uh, in the covenant relationship that happens at Sinai, this becomes the central piece. That's a good that's a good place to stop. I think Todd, if we can, beautiful. Um, yeah, th because now we're just we're really getting into the the meat of the situation with, um, like you say, the, the priest was wearing these things now, right? So it's a it's a it's a continuation of of uh, the unfolding revelation, right? Um, that it, you continue to to find out who God is, what he what he's like, why he's doing what he does. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, and I, I hope folks are now beginning to see the that just it's a, it's a massive topic uh, that we're going to explore even more. But um, as a believer, as a Christian, as part of the church, hopefully we can through this multifaceted. Um, uh, time here to see how it's important for us to know that this um, eventually what became the Exodus event was more than just a random happening or a, a, you know a one-time thing for uh, for God to get his people out of out of a particular place everything has purpose and reason um, and even through to now that your life that our walk with God that our time here and however long we have left until the Lord stands on the Mount of Olives um, all of it matters and it's all important to the lord um as you say to put our hands to this work you know every time every moment every heartbeat that we have to do it so um i bless you brother uh this is a lot of work and we, we haven't even touched on it to be honest with you i've seen i've seen a lot more than this uh and so we're, we're getting there we're getting there and we want to encourage everyone that yes this will continue yes we're going to put this uh up as an expanded uh, course for you for you to take uh, in a very short uh, period here, Lord willing. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed this. And until next time, Todd, we, we bless you. We hope uh, you are kept a, in the peace and the shalom of God as uh, in your household, as you've been led to do, and you are in the land. And that's, and there's, and there's dear Sarah in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Cause she's part of it too. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Uh, but the <laughs> Lord has led, led you guys to uh, this place that you're talking about. You're not just, uh, pontificating, right? You're not just uh, speaking out of a like a like a lecture or something. You live it. You're there. You've walked it. You li you live it. It's part of you. Yeah, yeah. Five times. <laughs> so yeah, you know what you're talking about. Anyway, man, you're a great blessing to us. I thank you, and uh, you we'll be back soon, right? Amen. Okay. Yes, we'll take it up here next time. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. You're welcome.